I guess we, we already have a part of our crowd here. So uh, yeah, maybe what I will do, uh, I think that we already pro probably already have some of the people that are here for the first time, right? After Indira and, and Dona went around advertising our research seminars uh, to, to other colleagues in Panama. Uh, I can tell you, this is uh, anyone who wishes to be here is welcome at any time. Of course, mainly for doctoral and master students, if you want to have a certificate from, and it's going to be from the, the Technological University of Paraná, uh, in this case for the seminars, it is important that you have filled that, that Google form, right? Because that will allow us to track attendance during the, the whole period from now until, until the, when we finish in, in early December. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, of course, you will commit, your, your commitment with this is to try and learn as much as you can, uh, to get involved in the, in the discussion, but mainly to prepare uh, a draft of a paper uh, until um, early uh, December. That is a paper that will be reviewed by some of us, some of the professors, and also by uh, some of your colleagues, because we will turn everyone into a reviewer. I told you in a previous uh, 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 meeting that the best way of learning how to write is when we start reviewing and finding out problems in other people's uh, uh, work. It's interesting, we don't find problems in our own work. It's all, almost like fathers and mothers that look at their babies and they're all, they, they always look the most beautiful babies on earth. Thank God it's like that, right? Uh, that means that they will care for their kids. Uh, we have to care for our papers. So it's, it's good that we, we like our papers, but at the same time, it's good when we start looking at other people's papers and say, well, the objective is not clear. Well, the methodology that was used there is not, the, uh, not suitable to reach the results, or at least it, it makes those results doubtful some, somehow. So all those things are things that we see on other people's work. And when we start you know, reviewing other people's work, I can assure you that we become more critical about our own work and that we improve the quality of our writing because we prevent those mistakes that we see on other people's work. We prevent them, them from happening in our own work, right? So this is why we will get you also involved. This will be part of our commitment here is when we get, uh, uh, let's say, uh, late November or so and we, we, we have the, a, a round of reviews, everyone will have their papers reviewed by someone else uh, and every, everyone will also become a reviewer right uh, for other people's uh, work and I can assure you that you will learn a lot from being reviewers as well and at the same time you will start becoming a little more forgiving with respect to, to those reviewers that review your work uh, in conferences and and, and, and and journals because you realize that what they're doing is trying to help right Guillermo yeah you or not, right? Uh, or not, or yeah, maybe, of course. Or maybe not. But yeah, but, but at least you will... You will understand why they said it. You, you, and and, and you, you become... What, what Guilherme is saying, of course, there are reviewers that, that make us uh, annoyed and upset. And, and that's, again, another, another thing that we, we hope that you learn is that we have to be gentle even when we are criticizing. I don't know how, how good we get at that. Uh, many times I've heard that my reviews were harsh and, and, and that I should be more gentle than I was being, although I thought that I was being gentle. Uh, but, uh, but we will, let's say, we will understand uh, the, let's say, what's happening at the other end of the process and we will realize uh, that that's the way things work uh, and, and that's a way of getting uh, our papers improved over time. So considering that we have uh, several colleagues here that are here for the first time and they may, may be wondering, what are we doing here? Someone invited us to, to, to be here and someone told us that this could be good for, I, I don't know, for our uh, work as, as uh, many, many, many of us here uh, uh, are professors as well or assistant professors or I don't know how you call it in your countries. We usually don't use the, 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 the term teachers for, for people that work in universities. But anyway, we are all involved in, in, or in teaching and even those who are students are planning to become, uh, to, to get involved with uh, teaching. And one part of teaching is uh, teaching our students 
to become, uh, let's say, to, to, to also become teachers of others in the future. And, and that also always involves some, uh, well, showing some criticism to things uh, that we believe that our students could improve in their, in their performance, but always doing that in a nice way that keeps them motivated and, and, and that makes them uh, understand that the criticism is to help their, their work become even better than it already is. Many times, for example, when uh, uh, Professor Guilherme, when I see uh, Professor Indira or myself or anyone is in, let's say, in, 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 a, in, in a committee that is reviewing a master's uh, or a doctoral uh, work, and uh, I, I have that feeling that you have three, four, five people that are there only to find out the mistakes, right? The problems with the student's work. And the student was working on that for two years, three years. It's, it's horrible that we, after so much effort that was put into that work, people go there and the only thing that they're trying to do is to find mistakes or find problems with the work. But the reason we do that is that uh, we want that the final version, that one that will go to the library of the university, uh, that one that will help generate uh, the papers that will be published in the future, what we want is that those are even better than the work that is being presented. So that's, that's uh, how we should uh, uh, feel about our babies, our papers, and our, about our thesis or our dissertation or, or whatever. And so for those that are arriving now, the discussion in these uh, uh, seminars is how to improve our writing skills and the, the result of our, our writing over time uh, and make uh, sure that we become more publishable. Uh, and we want our target now is AMSIS 2023 in Panama. We wish that we can celebrate uh, having several of us here uh, having papers published at that conference uh, next year, considering that it's going to be in, well, in, in Latin America and, and more specifically in Panama. Uh, so again, for those that are arriving now, uh, what we did over the last uh, few uh, few weeks, uh, we first, um, we first uh, had, well, the first day was an introduction, a presentation of this to those that were starting back then. Uh, I included here, and, and I, I'm sure that by, by now everyone has access to our Moodle platform, where we have all the research seminars uh, that we had in 2021, and uh, all the research seminars from 2020. In those two years, and, and, and by the way, if anyone has a, a sort of a blurred uh, image there when I present my, my slides here, it's because I'm presenting them as if they were my camera, right? The way to solve that is going to the, the, those three dots uh, in, your, in the configuration of uh, Google Meet and choosing configuration there and improving the quality of the, 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 the reception you're having, right? Uh, so maybe if you, if you have a problem with that, it's just the, the three vertical dots, go to configuration, and uh, over there you choose your camera, and then there is the input, res uh, input resolution. It's probably automatic, just try to have it as high as you can. It's probably going to be 720 pixels or so, which will already give you a, a, a better image. But anyway, uh, what we have here in, the, in, in our first class was our, uh, our first meeting here, we, we, I just put there links to the research seminars of previous years. And you may be thinking, why should we have a look at those? Well, uh, and mainly for those of you who are really interested in information systems. I know that uh, uh, Donna told me that there are some of you uh, uh, have a, a degree in mathematics or so. Maybe you're not so interested in, in information systems. Uh, then you're more interested in simply writing better papers. Uh, but if you are interested in our ag agenda of, of, of information systems, understanding, uh, maybe reviewing or checking what we did in previous years will show you ideas of topics that are interesting, right? Because each area has its own agenda. For example, for mathematics, I don't know, uh, 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 it may be uh, right now that everyone is, is interested in, in solving whatever... Um, research uh, uh, puzzle, well, mathematics puzzle that has been uh, challenging researchers for 300 years or whatever. I don't know, mathematics probably has its own, uh, you know, it has its own goals. We in information systems, 
We've been dealing with a lot of problems over the last 30 years, 30, 40 years, uh, and we are now uh, already foreseeing problems that will be important in the future. Uh, and and I, I think that they show a bit in those research seminars of, of the previous years, because we had a different agenda back then. We, we just had, we, we just invited people to give talks about the research that they were doing or topics that we thought that they thought that we should be researching. So there's a lot there. This is what we discussed the first day. Then uh, we, we sort of followed uh, with that uh, uh, still in August when we discussed uh, what are or should be our main question, research questions in information systems. Again, if you're from a different field, you can skip that. But for us, uh, that's important. Uh, and in fact, it's so important that, uh, well, today we'll deal with a methodology or with methods, which is basically the, how we get to where we want to go, right? Um, but next week we will go back to try and understand uh, what are the fundamentals of our area, what have we been studying over the all this the, all the time since information systems established itself as a, a, a research field, and where we want to go from 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 now on. Uh, we will advertise that uh, a little later. Uh, last week we talked a little bit about essay writing. Uh, I told you that it was the easiest, uh, probably. So, uh, type of writing that we could do because uh, there's no, uh, it, it's not so strict on structure, uh, but at the same time, it's the most difficult to publish because, uh, you know, people, researchers are very interested in your results, of course, in your ideas, but they are, they are just as interested in how did you get to those ideas because if your methods doesn't convince them, of course, the results are, are worth nothing. And the essay writing depends a lot just on your argumentation, uh, on your building arguments based on, on many times on your experience. And then who should write essays? Experienced researchers. And people will read their essays because they were, read, uh, they were written by people that those uh, other researchers believe to be uh, trustable in, 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 their, in their own opinion. Uh, it, 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 essay writing tends to be more opinion related, right? Uh, so easy, easier to write, more difficult to publish. So skip that from now, right? It's, we, we, we discussed that out of curiosity and, and to tell you, don't do it for now. Leave it for when you're uh, very seasoned in the field, uh, when people invite your papers instead of you having to compete with others for the scarce uh, uh, space uh, uh, journals have for publications. Uh, and then we get to today. Uh, again, uh, a little before Guillermo uh, arrived uh, here in our room, he, he promised that he would be here before most of you to make me feel a little more, uh, let's say, uh, um, easy on uh, that, that I would not have to improvise. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have to improvise because uh, uh, the idea today was to have him here to discuss uh, uh, some of the methods that we have been using uh, in, in information systems. Of course, each area uh, tends to emphasize different methods depending on the, the types of problems that those areas try to, to study and the, the, and, try, and, and the problems that they try to solve, right? Uh, so Guillermo will give us a, a, an overall idea of methods that are available to us and in future uh, moments uh, in these uh, seminars we will get more into, uh, into the details of some of these uh, different methods. Uh, well, uh, of course uh, Guillermo will tell you much more about what he will be, uh, be, be doing but uh, I have to tell you a little bit about Guillermo. Guillermo was uh, the founder, one, one of the founders of LACAIS, the Latin American and Caribbean Association for Information Systems. So this is why he looks uh, so much older than any any of us. Uh... <laughs> well, that was 20 years ago, by the way. So we are celebrating our 20th anniversary. Yes. Yeah. chapter. Uh, and and he, he's, he's put a lot of work uh, to make this community here possible. Uh, he was also uh, in, uh, someone, well, not behind, in front of the two or the two of the most uh, important uh, uh, AIS, AIS is the Association for Information Systems uh, Worldwide, the two, two, two conferences AIS 
has put in in well two 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 of the the, the three that it's put in 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 in, in Latin America. Uh, one of them in Acapulco uh, many years ago. I, I wasn't involved with uh, with this yet. Uh, the other one in, in Cancun that was closer to to. I mean, I still remember that very well. Although, I mean, I, sh I may maybe it, it's almost impossible that I could remember it, considering the amount of tequila and that that we had there. We had a lot of fun uh, in Cancun, and he was also involved uh, when uh, when uh, AIS brought the conference uh, to Lima in Peru as well. So, I mean, he's he's very important uh, to us uh, also because he's someone who's made uh, uh, Lac Ice, this Latin American chapter. Possible. So we thank you uh, very much, Guillermo, for being here with us. Uh, I guess the word is yours and uh, the floor is yours. And uh, I hope that you can uh, uh, put your slides up. Otherwise, we will figure out what we have to do at our end here. So thank you, Alexandre. How long do I have? Is it? Uh... Uh, we go for as long as, uh, as we want. We usually, what we have done is about, uh, we, we try to finish it before it gets to 1230 in Brazil because there are many fathers and, and mothers here that have to, to, to go and pick their kids, right? But we have, let's say, almost two hours if we wish or... The, the okay, time. good. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. Just just so, so, so that I know because uh, I don't want to be uh, a nuisance <laughs> for, for too long, right? Okay, let me share again. Uh, okay, thank you, Alexandre. As uh, you were speaking, I was changing my uh, title because <laughs> at the end I didn't know exactly what was the final version that we decided that we would have. It doesn't matter. At the end, uh, what I'm going to be talking about a little bit, and thank you for the opportunity, is uh, an overview, right, of uh, contemporary and not so contemporary research methods. Uh, so in the agenda, what I will be covering is just a few points, as you can see. Okay, the context of the social science research, uh, because these methods are intended for social sciences. Uh, the types of research, the concept of triangulation, the relevance and the importance of the relevance or the relevance of the relevance is that it's not too incredible to be said. Uh, some research models, some emerging models also for research, uh, some methods for data collection and some in, in all of this I'm going to be saying what is traditional and what is emerging, right? And data analysis methods as well. And uh, also, probably a few tips of thinking as an editor, right? What is it that editors and publishers want? Uh, some common mistakes and some final notes. So without further ado, let's uh, put it, everything into context, right? So we have research that can be generally divided as empirical or theoretical, right? In the empirical, the empirical we understand empirical research as that that is based on observation direct observation by the uh, researcher, uh, whereas in theoretical is more like mathematics that is more uh, based on uh, theoretical background and whatever can be proved, for instance, doing uh, equation proof and stuff like that. So for the theoretical, when we go to social sciences, we have two options. One is the grounded theory, which is a very formal way of uh, looking into what has been done and then just uh, bring the, the, the major concepts, put them together, associate one theory to the next, and then try to build from that. It's different, though, to the typical bibliographic review or the essay that I imagine. Bibliographic review, what I'm doing is basically just checking what's been written, try to put it together, and then try to make some sense of it, and then, and then uh, probably uh, produce some conclusion or some uh, further thoughts for it. Whereas in grounded theory, it's uh, it's a lot more complicated. It's not easy to do. Uh, in the empirical side, we have a qualitative versus quantitative. I'm sorry for this. I just make a little mistake here because this should be quantitative. Nothing that cannot be solved on the spot. Okay, so we have quantitative versus qualitative. In qualitative, generally, generally what we find is the case method and the recently popular action research method, and among others. Okay, I'm going to go further into that. Whereas in quantitative, the most common things we find is experimental research against survey research or even bibliometrics. And why am I saying bibliometrics as opposed to bibliographic review? Because the bibliometrics is, is based on counts of topics and publications that meet certain certain uh, 
uh, criteria, right, for, for search. In the bibliometrics approach, it's easy to do, but it's not the most popular, and it's not going to get you very far uh, in terms of publishing. If you really want to publish this in a good journal, it has to be very good bibliometrics. Otherwise, it's not going to be that well regarded. So anyway, without further ado, let's talk about what is the cycle of empirical research. And this is a, a derivation in 1982 from the original in 1972 by my graph, which is, is a reminder of what is it that we need to do every time we want to create some project and therefore a paper that is going to come after that. So the first thing I need to do is to choose and refine the research question. This sounds easy, yet uh, I guess 70% or 60% of the difficulty of doing a dissertation in the doctoral degree is choosing a good research question. Uh, once you have been successful at choosing your research question of doing some uh, uh, parsimonious design of your research that is going to be well contained and it's not the story of the of your, or it's not the plan uh, your life's plan for research but rather something that is doable in a certain period of time that is relevant that it has a good question uh, related to it then doing the rest is pretty much more much more automatic than it would be uh, just to figure the question that's that's something that is normally a very big problem for many so what's an example of a research question? Okay, so if I'm studying, for instance, the impact of information systems in the productivity of an organization. So one research question would be, that is very simple, do information systems improve the productivity of the organization? What's the problem with the research question? That the answer is yes or no. So if I say yes, what knowledge am I getting out of it? Not a whole lot, right? So, okay, now I know that, yes, they are productive, which, don't get me wrong, is a big step, because sometimes, I mean, there was a discussion for a long time uh, of the productivity paradox, saying whether something was productive or not was productive, or, or the industries that were investing the most in IT were not getting the, the productivity they desired. And uh, so it has been a discussion for a long time, yet, when I say yes or no, and answer, I answer yes, it's not giving me much information. What is a better research question? Okay, what are the factors or what are the characteristics that an information systems system must have and its implementation for being effective at increasing the productivity of the organization? That will give me a lot more knowledge. Yet, maybe I need to shorten it so that I can do a very doable project and then plan on the next steps to cover the next, uh, the following uh, uh, items of the question itself. Anyway, so it's not an easy thing to do. Let's not underestimate it. Choosing and refining the research question is a very important step. Then I need to choose the theory that is going to be around it, what's being written about it, and, and what is it that I can support my attempt to respond to that question. So basically, I pose the question, and then I say, okay, what is it that is written that can help me answer the question? So I review the theory, and then I produce a hypothesis, which is my proposed response for the question. Once I do that, then I choose a strategy, okay, to verify whether that response to the question is correct. And I choose a strategy, I choose a design, I choose the actors I, the, and the behaviors that I'm going to be observing at what times and what context. So, in other words, I'm going to say, okay, I'm, it's going to be probably the users of the information systems and how they use it at certain times and probably in certain in different periods or uh, times or uh, say uh, seasons in the world so that I can see if there are nuances or differences depending on where they're using it on the weekend versus the weekdays on uh, September instead of in September instead of January something like that whenever that might be uh, reasonable to observe because the theory tells me so. Then uh, I choose the treatment modes. What are the treatment modes? I can choose whether I'm going to control one variable or I'm going to measure one variable only to say control it by measurement rather than manipulating the variable itself. Or I'm going to manipulate the variable or I'm just going to leave it to random. So um, 
or try to try to uh, control it by randomization of the sample. So in other words, all the possible constructs that might be affecting my response have to have some type of treatment. Depending on the design that I choose to do, I will be using one or the other. Uh, then after I choose the treatment modes for the constructs, I choose the ways in which I, would, I, I convert the observations into useful data. That is precisely how is it that I'm going to be collecting the data. So if it's an experimental design, maybe I will be using certain instruments or measurements, or uh, for instance, how fast a request was solved using the system from the time the user comes, the, the, the client makes a request to the, to the moment it is declared as solved. And uh, that would give me some measure of productivity or a proxy of productivity, right? For instance, or I can say I'm, I'm doing a survey and in that survey, I will be measuring customer satisfaction. A, but customer satisfaction is something very qualitative. How do you measure that? Well, I can use a survey to try to get a proxy on what is the customer is feeling to try to reflect in certain questions with a liquor scale of one through five or one through seven, I think you know, the one through seven is the original, uh, bipolar scales trying to do my best to capture something that by nature is not measurable. And then I choose the procedures to analyze the data. Is it gonna be quantitative? Then I can do whatever technique, statistical technique is available for me, depending on what, on the nature of the data and what is it the question, what is the question that I want to answer? Or if it's qualitative, well, maybe I want to do content analysis. It all depends on how, what, what kind of design I have and what is best for the, tip, for the data that I have at hand. Then I choose the conclusions to interpret the results. So, okay, I get the data, I get the results, I need to look at it and say, okay, this looks like this is happening. Therefore, okay, this is what I can conclude in terms of did I respond or not uh, to, my, to my research question and what the response to my research question is. Once I have done that, then I can reflect on the results to choose a new research question that helps me deepen the knowledge that I want to achieve. Uh, there is something important uh, that is called triangulation. No matter how well designed my research is, I will never be achieving all the objectives of a, of a good project. So, uh, so to speak, uh, I can never have, I can never maximize generalization if I am maximizing frictions of context. If you think about how this works. Okay, so uh, for instance, I am in doing a uh, survey. The survey is very good to do external validity, which means the results of my study can be applied to different contexts. So for instance, I'm doing a study that uh, is applied to all the uh, manufacturing industry. Can I generalize this results to the services industry? Well, it does if I did a cross-sectional sample, in which I have manufacturing services and probably in many different countries so that I can generalize it also internationally. But if I do a survey, I have very specific questions that I'm asking and I'm not allowing for deeper understanding of whatever is happening, just whatever my instrument can provide me. If I want to go deeper and get more richness of the, of the context, then I need to go to a different to a different method, which would be probably the case method. In the case method, I only concentrate in one company probably or two, but I go deep asking and observing everything in detail. The further I move to richness, I go away from generalization. The further I go to generalization, I move away from richness. Same thing with rigor. If I want to uh, maximize the internal validity, that is how much I can say that the causality that I am proposing is there with the statistical rigor that it requires. So, so in other words, if I say that X produces Y, with what confidence can I say that really X produces Y? So an experimental study is the one that maximizes rigor and internal validity. But an experimental study is in a very controlled context. It's in a very controlled, with all the variables are controlled. For instance, in physics, if I control the temperature, I keep the temperature 
uh, constant, then I can see that if I apply pressure, that is manipulated pressure, controlling constant, putting constant uh, temperature, I see a change in volume, which would be Y. Okay, Y is the, is, is the result. So X, which would be pressure, produces a change in Y. I can do that if I have a very controlled setting. Now, organizations by themselves are not controlled settings. So I need to move people into labs and try to control as much as possible whatever I'm doing. So experimental studies in social science are kind of difficult, yet they're possible. But since no one study is going to give me the three characteristics that I wish for, which is richness of context, internal and external validity, I need to triangulate. Meaning, if I choose to start by building theory in the qualitative area, once I have built the theory based on whatever grounded theory or other things that I, I can produce, or probably from a case study, I find a plausible explanation for phenomenon, then I need to validate that whatever I'm saying that X produces Y is true. So I change to an experimental setting. And then I need to reproduce that in several contexts to be able to do external validity. But no one study will do them all. So it's very important to triangulate among the different methods so that I get the maximum benefit from each one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, let me think. Okay, so what? Important, so important question. The so what question is so good. I have run into so many papers that are very well written that have the methodology you use is fantastic. It's so crisp. Everything is right in place. The problem they have is that you say, what changes does this paper do to my life before I read it to after I read it? Nothing. Because the question is completely irrelevant or very, very irrelevant. And it's very easy. Watch out, guys. It's very easy to be lost into a very completely useless question and then do everything around it and, and learn the methodology very well and apply the survey method and the statistics very nicely to answer something that is simply not relevant. What is relevance? One thing is what you want to say and a very different thing is what's interesting for the people, okay? The conjunction is relevance. Whatever is important to you, but it's also important for your audience, for the people out there, for the people in the field. So who cares and why should we care? Well, something that contradicts a very well-established theory or model, for instance. Okay, so I come with this. <laughs> There's a theory in information systems, and I'll deny this, uh, that uh, has been extremely studied, which is the TAM model, right? The technology acceptance model. Uh, this model by Fred Davis has been very successful ever since it was done back like probably 40 years ago. Uh, but it has been so studied and so used and so applied and so extended in everybody that it came to a point in which I think it just has nothing else to contribute. But what if I come up with one model that says, you know what, TAM is not right. And it's a very well grounded concept or, or paper and, and study that actually says all oh, this is wrong because of this. That's relevant because everything is something that has been the common belief by many people and very used in for a long time. All of a sudden it's not, it's not really right. Well, that would be something to talk about, right? Or what if I have a topic that integrates previous work and gives them structure? Right? Like, yeah, everybody has been studying this phenomenon a little bit here, a little bit there. For instance, I don't know, uh, smart cities. And there you have the smart cities, and some people talk about the, uh, the, the uh, uh, reactions or the behavior of the people in the smart cities and the acceptance to the, the smart cities. Others talk about the infrastructure of the smart cities. Others talk about governance of the smart cities. So why don't I come here and do, say, uh, probably a meta-analysis of all this? And then I give structure to everything that has been written in smart citizens. I see what's there and what's the gap. Another example of something that would be relevant is something that triangulates and strengthens 
something already proposed and quite accepted. So not as over exploited as them, but some theory that is coming that has been only looked at from the case study point of view. So why don't I come in and I try triangulate and I support it or I validate whatever model they created qualitatively through some some very uh, well organized and planned statistics uh, through a survey method or any other kind of probably secondary uh, documentation uh, collecting and I use that data to uh, validate that model that would be relevant or if it addresses a topic that attracts other researchers or people from other sectors okay so not necessarily everything that is in information systems but things that are also very very buzzwords for many fields so for instance if i talk about uh iot internet of things or i talk about industry 4.0 and some of the things that are there uh so those are by nature transdisciplinary topics so if i do all of a sudden come in and use that and i bring it one step further then it might be something that people are interested in reading and hence it's relevant and or if it fills the gap in the field of knowledge so i have everything from the perspective of the three uh, uh horns of the triangle yet talking about unit of analysis understand it by unit of analysis whether i do the study in the individual point of view the organizational point of view or probably the national point of view uh everything has been done say in the individual and organizational but nothing has been done nationally okay then I'm filling a gap in the field of knowledge. So again, also if it has a very large potential practice, practical relevance, it is very important that the papers that we do, if possible, will eventually reach a, a larger audience, right? Not only the information systems professors, but also the uh, practitioners. So can this have the, the possibility of becoming eventually a methodology that I can apply in the real world? Models that we produce theoretically can be easily converted into methodologies and it can be applicable in the real world as a consulting practice. So if I do, for instance, a model for the determination or the composition of uh, like uh, uh, one that I did that is digital transformation, okay then I do an instrument, a certain methodology that will help me uh, apply it to the companies and measure probably what level of digital transformation you have and also provide what changes you need to do immediately to try to mature in your level of digital transformation. If I can do something that is applicable, it will be a lot more relevant than if I, it only serves in the ether in the academic world. Uh, if it provides clarity, to solve a major social technical problem as well, right? Like, uh, I don't know, probably when we talk about international technology transfer, and uh, there are certain regulations that are a real problem for achieving or applying certain models that say that you can always uh, leverage the use of technology in multinationals. Okay, so you use certain things to clarify about that, that is going to be relevant or if it offers innovative alternatives to improve someone's life. Important, very important. What we do should be always targeted at the end. The ultimate goal of our work should be to make people's life better. So how is this research of mine eventually going to affect somebody's life? And that's the question that I know is very ethereal and very philosophical, but eventually, whenever you're thinking of a question or a, or a particular uh research line that you want to follow, ask yourself that. How is this going to make a difference in somebody's life? And if you haven't considered it, it's just a matter of shaping your line of research to do so. And if it provides support for generating relevant public policies also, so that I can justify and present to politicians, which I know they are not easy to uh, talk to or they generally tend to not to understand or feel, how do I make them understand that something is being supported so that this policy would be good for the country?
So let's talk about emerging models or not so emerging, all right? Uh, one of some of the emerging models that exist that uh, some researchers have ventured into, yet it's a risky business to try to do something very different because some editors love it and some editors hate it, is ethnography, right? Ethnography, for instance, is observation and coexistence in the real context. In other words, if I, I'm studying the behavior, let's think outside of the IS realm. If I'm studying the behavior of people in the subway of a city, the metro, what is it that I do? I go every day to the metro and I travel on the metro for three hours on different days, different lines and different uh, times. And I just sit there or stand there, watch and observe and make notes, okay? And I observe the behavior, and then I realize that there are certain trends, right? That, that morning morning is definitely different to Saturday afternoon, and then this line, people are a lot more civilized than this other, and this might be because of, and then I start by observing and going to live in the community that I'm working. So in other words, in information systems, how would this work? If I am studying behavior of people in social networks, then I have to be in the social network, and I have to be there observing what everybody else is doing. Careful that I do not intentionally modify the environment where I am. But since I'm part of it, I have to do action. It's not like in a case study that I do not touch everything, anything. I totally watch. Uh, I do have to have some action that will modify the environment that I'm studying because I need to be one of the subjects that I'm studying. So it's kind of a, another thing that is interesting, for instance, life stories and narrative. This is uh, a way of collecting data uh, by telling people, asking people, tell me about your life or tell me about certain events in your life. And they have to tell it on their own words. And, I, and you just basically listen to everything they have to say. And then you have to go into the story and the narrative and grab whatever concepts are important for you to study a certain phenomenon. Uh, this is very common. These techniques are more common for international comparative studies of cultural aspects. They have to do more with the social part of the discipline. Uh, phenomenology. That's a, it has a very, uh, say, uh, intimidating name. But phenomenology basically is understand a phenomenon based on people's perceptions about it, okay? So uh, if I'm saying, okay, I need to understand an implementation of an ERP, okay? What's in it? What are the characteristics that make it successful or not? Then rather than seeing the documentation of the project, I ask people about their perception on the process. What are their perspectives? What are the interpretations? And therefore I can extrapolate based on the common understanding, I can extrapolate whatever the group thinks. So it is possible to perceive essential structures of a particular issue, which in this case would be the implementation of the ERP and some relationships, okay? Uh, it also helps me observe other similar phenomena to fine tune common structures. So this was an implementation of an ERP, but what if it's an implementation of an, an intranet? Or what is an implementation of any other system in the organization? Uh, probably uh, a new flexible manufacturing system. So I observe similar things and I find two common structures. Uh, it's based on transcendental phenomenology, phenomenology by Edmund Husler. So it's time for a dialogue. Yes, are you ready? This is Socrates. Yes, Socrates. Okay, so, oh good. It is now when Socrates asks us questions and makes us look like idiots. That's the part that I like the most. If you think about it, it's like a, whenever you engage into a dialogue, a scientific dialogue with anybody, which is what we try to do in conferences, what we try to do over a beer in a bar in, in, in a certain meeting. Uh, yeah, that's what we do. Basically, when we question is what we're doing, and then we try to, we enjoy when we are exposed to being treated like an idiot. But in a softer way, okay? This is a, is a, is a, is a, a very uh, uh, softer or say a very uh, uh, productive or constructive way of criticism. Uh, why am I saying this? Because this is based on reflection. 
one of the models that is a lot based on reflection and correcting what you did wrong is action research. Action research is a hot, hot methodology, yet for some editors, from others not, okay? And it has to be very carefully applied because a lot of people will say this is not action research. What is it that is action research? As the name says, it's based on action. So in other words, you are part of the team that is going to be solving a problem. So you're going to be taking actions that are going to be affecting a real setting that has a problem. Be careful because the main objective of the action research methodology, the main uh, priority is to solve the problem that a company has or a society, a community, whatever is your unit of analysis. You have to solve the problem. And in doing so, you obtain very valuable information that is going to help you uh, understand what's going on and create knowledge, okay, and do research. So it, it, it uh, depends entirely on your ability to establish a collaboration between researchers and the people in the organization. Due to its practical nature, it has a great strength in being relevant. Okay, why would it not be relevant if in the first place its main objective is to solve a problem in an organization? Obviously, it is relevant for the organization. Now, your research that is going to try to bring from the singular to the general, some theory, that is also going to be relevant because it appeals to something that happens in organizations today. So dialogues are constant communication. Dialogues are a must. How does it work? So first you have to be aware of a problem. I'm not gonna read all this, just to, for you to know that it has a cyclic nature, right? So you have to be aware. So you reflect on a problem and you try to imagine or to understand what the problem is and how it works. Then you go into planning or proposing what would be a potential solution for that problem and you put it into practice. Once you put it into practice, then you observe the results of what's happening. And based on that observation, you do an evaluation and propose changes to the solution. Make the changes and go to the next uh, cycle which would be basically this, right? So you plan or you become aware of, then you act, then you observe, then you reflect, then you plan again and go to the next plan. Act, observe, reflect. Once you come to, to, to reflection again, then you go to cycle three. And when does it end? When the problem is solved, okay? So what characteristics are there according to Prang? Cyclical, recursive, and there are similar steps that tend to be repeated in a similar sequence. It's very participatory, okay? So clients and informants are involved as partners. The researchers are part of the solution team. It's qualitative, okay? It deals more with language than in numbers. Probably the only quantitative part that it has is when you do evaluate the results. And it's reflective, okay? So critical reflection on the process and results are important part of each cycle. If you think about it, it's a lot more like continuous improvement techniques, right? When, when you have a Six Sigma and all this, that you do these groups and these cycles in which you know what you changes you made, then you reflect on them and then you go back to it. The difference, though, is that right now what you're doing also is documenting everything that is happening. You're documenting everything that is happening so that you can, besides solving the problem, create some knowledge, create some new models, or do some proposals. Uh, there's another derivative uh, or, or say it's probably arguable arguably a type of action research that is design science research i say arguably because it's not always apply in a real just to solve a particular problem in, a, in, in an existing context a design science research is based on generating an artifact that will solve a problem okay the artifact can be anything. It can be a, a, an application, for instance, that I will be using in an experiment, or it can be a, uh, a new system, or it can be a new training way, or it can be a model, or it can be a software, it can be a method. So I become aware of the problem, then I suggest the solution, I develop the artifact, then I evaluate, okay, the, the performance of the of, uh, apply the artifact, 
and then I can go back to problem awareness. It also has a cyclical nature like the action research uh, method had. And then I come to conclusion and I gain the uh, general knowledge that I wanted to gain from it. So it can have many, many cycles depending on what is the objective. And the cycles do not have to be exactly the same. Some of these cycles can be quantitative, some others can be qualitative, which is mainly, it, it, I, I guess, probably one of the main differences to, to the pure action research. Design science research, uh, back in the days, uh, I don't know, uh, Alexandre, if you remember, we were in, in, in Chile, and mm -hmm. there was a panel of the editors, and they were saying, when asked, Patrick Chow said, uh, what is it that you look for that you look for in articles that are submitted to your journal? And Patrick Chow would say anything on design science. Do you still okay. remember what what Shaw said then, back then, five years ago or so? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And, and why? Because it was a hot method, right? It was a new uh, a new method that I was uh, that was uh, being very uh, gaining a lot of interest in the readers. So you can you have to keep in mind that any uh, editor will have something, want, want something not only that is very well constructed, but also that will gain the attention of the readers because they want the journal to be read by more people. So it has to be sexy, all right? And design science research back then and yet still today is very sexy. Just a note before I forget, but basically uh, there is a tendency in European journals to uh, give more or want more uh, qualitative research papers. And in the American and, and Western journals, those are more quantitative. Uh, so it's not a common rule. Of course, there are qualitative papers in the US and there are quantitative papers in, in, in Europe. But there is a certain trend that, that is common there. So when we collect data, what are the traditional methods that we use, OK? Well, we can observe. We can be there and observing everything that is happening, uh, like I'm observing the employee's work. Or I can go to secondary data and files, like if I want to do some analysis on the uh, profitability of systems, then I go to the financial records, right? How much was invested versus how much was produced. Uh, or I can do surveys, right, and, and, and do my, my totally agree versus totally disagree, Likert scales, surveys, bipolar scales. Or I can do in-depth interviews if I'm doing more qualitative methods. And, and in-depth interviews is when I want to uh, maximize the richness of the context. Or I can do focus groups instead of in-depth interviews, which, or I can do both as a combination. Focus groups are good in the sense that whenever you have too many people to interview, if you put them together, then you can do it faster, having five of them in the same group. And also it uh, promotes uh, alternative thinking because there's discussion. So it gives it an extra richness that the in-depth interview doesn't. But on the other hand, the in-depth interview has no bias of I'm going to say this and I might not say it if I'm in front of another person. Mm -hmm. uh, potential problems of these methods, the self-report. What is a self-report? Self-report is when I know that I'm being asked something and I want to guess what is the uh, goal of the researcher. And therefore, I'm going to be answering, aiming at producing that goal and making me look good, okay? So it's a biased response based on what I guess is the intention of the study. A Hawthorne effect, that is when it was proven that uh, whenever you observe workers, and it was evident that the observer was there, the workers would work differently, okay? So if you feel observed, your behavior changes. So you have to mask or, or, or hide your observation, otherwise you will make a change in behavior and you will not be measuring as it is in nature. Uh, the couple, is, is this I'm when the, the researcher feels that he, he or she should be a fly on the wall? Very much, yeah, unless the fly is so noticeable, okay? <laughs> that is like a green big fly, then it might not work. Yeah, but it should be. That would be the idea, to be a fly in the wall. Nothing noticeable. You're not there. And it's not enough that you say you're not there. Now, probably, probably a little bit of this effect will disappear with time when 
the workers get used to you. They get used to you being there. Then you become a fly in the wall. Uh, the common method bias is when you are biasing the answers because of the instrument itself. Okay, the instrument has certain characteristics that is uh, producing a certain response, a certain bias in the response, and it should be uh, it should be eliminated. And the validity and reliability of the instrument, sometimes they are not going to be very reliable or sometimes uh, they're going to be very hard to determine, okay? Uh, what are the alternatives? What are all the methods now that are very becoming for uh, gathering data? Web scraping, for instance, right? Getting and analyzing text on social networks and messaging or text mining. Or, for instance, in some cases, tracking the movement of the eye in the computer. There are certain uh, software packages in research labs where you are, for instance, this is very common, for instance, when you are in the user interface um, research area, that you want to know how effective a certain interface is. And so they get you an experiment in an experimental lab, uh, uh, lab, but you don't know that you are actually being tracked your eyes being tracked. So what they do is they measure what is it that you're looking at first, how your eye is moving, and why is it changing the way it is changing. And they are gathering information based on the movement of your eye rather than just on the clicks that you make. And um, or there's a lot of data that is being captured from surveillance cameras, from sensors, or simply for collecting photographs. And uh, in, in Facebook, for instance, you can do a lot of, uh, uh, if you have access to it from the photographs, you can actually analyze a lot of the behavior or simply by analyzing what people are wearing. Or uh, the GPS is giving a lot of information. We know this is happening by tracking uh, and our behavior. What is it that we're doing? What are we purchasing? Where, what site do we visit after we visit another one? And all this information is actually available, readily available to companies like Facebook, like Google, etc. And they do have this information for sale. So uh, it's also very valuable. It can be very valuable for research. And there's another one that is nice, that is creative writing. Uh, where, that is like kind, of, kind of similar to life stories and narrative. But in this case, what they do is they ask you to write a novel or they ask you to write poetry. And then you can extract some information based on whatever you wrote. Of course, you have to choose the right one depending on, 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 on what is it that you want to do, right? So for data analysis, that once we collected the data, what is the traditional data analysis that we find? When it's qualitative, normally we go to content analysis. And in content analysis, the most typical things is I'm going to do word counts and I'm going to build semantic networks. So I codify certain constructs and I do analyze based on the words that were uh, transcribed from the in-depth interviews or from the focus groups, uh, the relationships between the constructs. Uh, and I can do that with software like Atlas TI or some others, right? Or theoretical comparisons, right? So basically I ask them and then I contrast against the theory and then I try to make some, some sense out of it. In quantitative, we can have descriptive or we can have inferential. Uh, when it's descriptive, is when I want to say the current status of what's happening, right? So, okay, 30% of the women think that uh, information systems is not a, a hot topic. Okay, I'm just saying a, an example. Uh, inferential, on the other hand, is when I want to uh, show that something causes something else. So in, and I can have parametric and non-parametric techniques. I usually do transformations of the data and then regression and then probably part, partial least squares, structural equation modeling, discriminant analysis, classification analysis, explanatory or predictive. Uh, we all took all this in the, in the regular stats class. It's not my intention to go through each one of them. But basically, is my, my point is choose the technique that applies to the sample not the other way around. For me, transformation of the sample is torturing the data to fit your technique. And mm -hmm. it should not be that way. It's, it will more like, what is the nature of my data? And therefore, I choose the technique that is best for it. 
What are alternatives ways of uh, alternative ways of, of uh, analyzing data? Okay, combinatorial analysis, for instance, which is a part of mathematics in which I look for common structures and what characteristics these structures have and what is the likelihood that somebody or something will fit into that structure. Uh, another one that is interesting is the positivist case approach to testing theories. So rather than just testing theories through quantitative analysis, I'm using case analysis, but I need to you do it in certain way that I make it quantitative enough to test the theory. Uh, or algorithms based on artificial intelligence, or say uh, even simulations, right, that are not necessarily um, regarded as very good for, for hypothesis testing, rather no, I'm not. And, and analytics or data science in any of its ways, right? Uh, so there are so many other ways of seeing what's going on. And obviously, what one has to be aware of, though, is of the limitations of each one of these techniques. What is it that they can and cannot do? So how far can I go with each one of these? But they are great for, especially for complementing uh, one analysis. And what do and I say we because I act as an editor too, as Alexander is an editor too, and many of us have been editors. What do we want, okay? Or what do they want? Who is this evil person that is going to reject my paper or tell me that it has a lot of uh, work to be done? Okay, what editors are looking for is cutting edge themes, right? Something that is sexy, a buzzword, a hot topic. Relevance of the scope. So if I see something that is very well done, but simply the the research doesn't take me anywhere. I'm going to make an example. I recently, well, probably a year ago, reviewed a paper that was based on algorithms, right? So they were saying this algorithm is much better than this algorithm because it's going to be much faster. The problem was not that. Okay, so the analysis of the algorithms and the creation of algorithms was perfectly okay. But it was applied to schools scheduling courses and assigning those courses to professors. So it says, oh, this is 0.8 seconds faster than the other one. It's 0.8 seconds or even 80 seconds relevant when scheduling courses and assigning the courses to a professor? Of course not. It's absolutely absurd. So the relevance there is completely inexistent. If you are doing a paper on algorithms, look for a different topic, not for score scheduling. I mean, they wanted to fit it in an education journal. Obviously, it did not go through. I mean, and there was nothing wrong with the method. It's just that the question was ridiculous and the, the contribution was absolutely inexistent. So another one is they want to see new methods, but well applied. And I put it in between parentheses or not. Many editors are very traditional. They don't want to see new methods. They want to see the same recipe. And some others want you to think out of the box. So how do you know which one is going to be? You don't, you don't, you don't know. Okay. So the best thing you can do is to try to look at the journal, see what kind of papers, what methods are being displayed and published and get an idea that probably the likelihood of your paper in certain methodology is better for this journal than for this other. Uh, so solid, very solid theoretical basis. Okay. And having references from prestigious sources is nothing more disappointing than seeing a paper that has all the, the relevant the references are from probably up to 1998 or 2005, or the, ref, the, the, the journals, none of them is a journal that you and I know, or uh, simply they're not enough. Like 12 references for a journal is not enough. They want a well-told story. Sometimes, and this is one of the most frustrating as an editor. You see a very good paper with a lot of potential, but boy, are they bad to tell the story. They write horribly. They don't do a very good job at engaging you in a story that is actually like storytelling, that is like a, like a fabio or like a, a kid story that takes you there, right? That hooks you and takes you to the end because it's interesting. No, 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 they're very bad. They have something really good there but they're terrible at telling it. So if you're not good at writing, get help. Uh, something that I can be excited about, right? I want to see something that I can be excited about and something actually that catches the reader's attention. Not something that from the abstract, you lost me because it's so boring. And he said, oh my God, and I, now I need to read all this 
uh, this this article. I am biased as an editor already because I already didn't like it. And unless you really surprise me once I go in, it's not going to be a good result. But if you catch my attention from the very beginning, then I'm going in. Now be careful not to oversell it because if you're catching attention just saying something that is not going to be delivered, then you're overdoing it. So what opportunities for topics that are relevant you might find? Well, there are plenty, but since we're living in the Industry 4.0 uh, uh, era, obviously you need to think about anything on cybersecurity, on the sharing economy, on IoT, Internet of Things, things that have to do with cloud, things that have to do with artificial intelligence, big data, open innovation, uh, collaborative, or, or uh, what do you call this? Uh, Collaborative intelligence, what uh, is it that you study, Alexandre? Uh, collective intelligence. Collective intelligence, thank you so much. Well, thank you for including it together with all these buzzwords. Absolutely, it's, absolutely. I mean, it's a must. If you're thinking of open innovation, how can you not be thinking of collective intelligence? It has to be there, it's in the back. Uh, smart cities, for instance, or anything that has to do with the effects of hyper connectivity in those lights. And it's not only those topics, you can talk about, uh, because you can talk, for instance, if you go for IoT and you and artificial intelligence mixed together, and you say, okay, I want to talk about uh, uh, automated vehicles, right? And, uh, and, and, and the self-driving vehicles. Okay, I can look at it from the social point of view. I can look at it from the ethical point of view. I can look at it from the, from the uh, work point of view. Or I can look at it from the implementation or integration of systems point of view. So there are many, there are always many uh, perspectives that you can go to in a particular in a particular topic. Common mistakes that we do. Common mistakes. Having a great story but not knowing how to tell it. I already talked about this. Follow the model of the instant box. This is exactly how they told me to do it. I'm going to do it right there because it's a safe bet. Yeah, sure. But unless you really have a very relevant question. Following the instant box is not an immediate sell. Okay, add one more strike to the tiger. I, I'm using uh, 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 expressions that I just translated from from Spanish. Like, uh, I'm just adding one more strike to the tiger, or I'm giving you breath with the same spread, or as they say in English, the same old, same old. It's like, a, don't talk about the same that everybody else is talking. Don't give me exactly the same. Give me something that is interesting and is original. Not having a good research question for starters, right? Or torture the data to accommodate the technique and not other, not the other way around. Or suppose theoretical articles with weak bibliographic review and without format comparison or grounded theory. Uh, don't give me one of those. This is a theoretical article. And I'm going to give you a bibliographic review. But the bibliographic review actually only cites two bibliographic reviews. I mean, that's an immediate no. Okay? And I've seen it. Uh, concluding without strength. It's very common. I understand by the end of the paper you want to finish so badly that you just give a quick conclusion. But the quick conclusion is generally not a conclusion. It's a summary. It's like putting the abstract again at the end. That's not a conclusion. Beware. Or you give me some conclusions that are so weak that I can tell that you were tired and you wind up without energy. No, conclusion is where you need to finish at the top. That's when you need to really sleep before doing them and then say, okay, how do I finish at the top? My, my, this is where I'm more, most excited because I already did all this. And guess what? That means this. That's where you have to put extra effort and give it a really good close at your article. Otherwise, it's gonna be like, huh? So what? It's like a bad ending of a soap opera. Uh, clinging to what has been done, ignoring the reviewer justifying oneself. Uh, it's like, okay, I get the review, and the reviewer tells me, okay, you need to improve this because this is not clear because blah, blah, blah. And then you reply, justifying everything you did and not changing anything. Oh, we did this because this is black, and the reviewer is wrong bad idea open your mind if they're telling you there's something wrong yeah maybe some reviewers are not that good but there's something behind it in the message that you sent that did not click on that reviewer and there's 
therefore, there's some improvement that you can do in your paper. Uh, changing journals. This is one of my favorites. Ignoring the review. Okay. So I got rejected, and I got a review that said that I needed to redo everything. Okay? Or redo certain things. Instead of taking care of those comments, I'm mad, and then I take my, my paper, just as it was, to another journal. <laughs> well, guess what? If your journal, if your, if your paper was on a particular topic, who do you think the expert on that topic is? The reviewer that just rejected your paper. So if you turn it into a different journal, they're going to call that person. And believe me, the same reviewer will follow you to the afterlife. Okay? <laughs> so pay attention. Take those into consideration and do it. I have seen examples of that. Reviewers telling me, can you believe they did not do anything? And if at least they had done the changes, submitted to a different journal, I would have taken that into consideration. But when I see that they simply ignore everything, well, that's an immediate reject again. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that reviewer is going to be your nightmare. So you better pay attention. And maybe, just maybe, the reviewer did have something really valuable to say, especially if that reviewer is the expert in the topic. Mm -hmm. And multitudinous authorship. Okay, I turn in my paper, and it has seven authors, eight authors. What? Really? Yeah. I mean, it's not good to have more than four authors. Five tops never go beyond that. It doesn't look good. I mean, what the author number eight do? Go for the pizzas and the pepsis? I mean, in some cases, it might be justifiable when you have a study that you did in eight countries. So each one of them is what the, 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 the one that did the part in each one of the countries, okay? But for the most part, that's going to be kind of a useless authorship. In some uh, evaluation research systems, they will penalize you depending on how many authors you have in your, in your, in your, in your uh, article. And if you're not first author in any of them, that might not look good on your career either. So try to be the first one in some and try not to have too many buddies just hanging in there. Or if you put me in your paper, I'll put you in mine and then we have two. It's not going to work that way. Some final notes before I bore you to death. So having a solid methodology is not enough to have a great research project. Superheroes, they actually solve real problems. So you have to be relevant, okay? Go for something that is going to make a difference and then envelop a nice solid methodology around it. A good categorization in a system of researchers like this knee in Mexico or Concisive in Chile or any other, I don't know, in Brazil, uh, is the consequence of good constant research work, not the end by itself. So uh, it's not the goal to be great in the categorization of the search researchers in my country. It's the consequence of being a great researcher. So we need not to forget which one is the egg and which one is the chicken. So you have to dare to think out of the box. And if you don't want to be too aggressive in being an alternative, Put some alternative methods together with some traditional ones. So you can have the traditional review at ease, but on the other end, you are adding some value, but giving a different perspective from a different method that is not so well uh, used. The best way to do this is to get together with those in another box, okay? So if I, I want to do something in ethnography, then I go to a professor in the social sciences and sociology that does it does ethnography, and then we think of something doing together. The world is transdisciplinary, so you have to model it in the best possible way in the many disciplines that it has. A combination of methods strengthens always the arguments because you do triangulation, and therefore you are going to be covering within, within uh, viability and with, within reason many different parts of the triangle in one research, yeah, only that one is going to be the main focus and the other ones are just going to be small, uh, say, small uh, verifications of the other horns in the triangle. And this is, for instance, something that Eisenhardt has, was very strong about in the case analysis method, saying that you can have some quantitative verification of whatever findings you're getting from the qualitative analysis of the case. And that will give you some information that you can use then to move to the next step and do some other qualitative uh, observations. So with that being said, uh, thank you so much. Muchas gracias, mucho obrigado. And I'm open for questions uh, whenever, whatever you might have. Okay, well, 
thank, thank you very much, uh, Guillermo, for that. Uh, it's uh, we already have at least one question in our chat. Uh, the one by Josir. How to deal with the ethical aspects of this kind of research? He then mentions that he was only thinking about the bio uh, bio scan methods, but nowadays we have to consider. Well, I, I don't I don't even think that it's the ethical aspects of the research, but it's the the ethical committees that will be there even before the gatekeeper the, the, the traditional gatekeepers that would be those that are thinking if your if your research is relevant uh, or or well, rigorous and everything we, we already have these committees everywhere right I think we, we, we should even have a, a full session one of these days to talk about ethical problems and the ethical problems that the ethical committees are bringing uh, to researchers as well because many times uh, uh, yeah, probably, probably that's a bit that. Yes, of course. You but, have to go through the screening of the, of the ethical committees in your university to approve your research project. Uh, but also, I think there are two things that are very important in this case. One is, do you have the consent of the person you're researching? Hmm. So you have not to tell them what you want to do. I mean, what the objective of your study is entirely to avoid the uh, self-report. But you do have to tell them. If I, I'll be, I'll be watching. Uh, what you do in a particular interface and I might be using some biometric are you in agreement with that if they say yes then you have on the other side on the other hand if you do not identify individual information mm -hmm. that is available to anybody else right but you actually only present aggregate data probably from uh, the web as well right uh, that was captured biometrically, but you cannot identify any subject, mm -hmm. then you are, say, a step beyond uh, on the safer side. But still, uh, well, maybe a follow-up question is, uh, would be, is it still possible for us to just be the discrete fly on the wall? Maybe, unfortunately not. Uh, but but let's have that, uh, let's have a full session on, on ethical issues. Uh, this is uh, one topic that I am usually in the old-fashioned uh, uh, researchers side uh, and I still would prefer my students and, and, and prefer the researchers to be in charge or responsible for the ethics in their research. I, I, I myself believe that the only way that we can be ethically resp responsible is if we take that in our hands and don't delegate that to a committee uh, uh, all the time. But, uh, but this is a polemic view because many times even the journals will now say, well, if you haven't gone through a, 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 an ethical uh, committee beforehand, I will not even accept to read your paper. So uh, uh, the next generations of uh, researchers will definitely have to concern much more, not only about the ethical problems of their research, about the, but about being, uh, having to, 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 to deal with a, a committee uh, that wants to be more responsible than themselves for the research that they want to do. And it is a valid question yeah. too, uh, but this is particularly important for experimental designs. Yeah. When, uh, that is when you're going to be manipulating and you know the subjects very well. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Because normally, for instance, in surveys, you make them anonymous. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. I don't know who you are. So therefore, I cannot identify your data and you're okay. Mm -hmm. But in, in experimental design, yeah, that, that is more of an issue. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we'll have to deal with uh, definitely in, in the future. Uh, well, whoever has a question, just open your mics. Uh, Guilherme was here, uh, you know, and uh, we'll be very happy to, to answer questions that you have. If anyone wants to ask those questions in Portuguese or Spanish, feel free. We will have them uh, translated because there are people in this uh, uh, call that do not speak any of those two languages, but we understand that it's a way of if, if that makes you more comfortable, feel free. I guess I was overwhelmingly boring. That's okay. Part, well, well, <laughs> and while, while they're, they're still getting their courage to, to ask uh, questions, Guillermo, I would, you know, when you, you, when, when you Should were... Should I ask questions to any of them? I can do that. Uh, yeah, you, you, you could to check if they were paying attention to what you were saying. Did but were there? but I have a reflection <laughs> here yet uh, uh, about that triangle that you showed. I mean, we usually there's a, a, a huge debate between rigor and relevance, right? Yeah. When you when you well when you put rigor and relevance 
in 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 that triangle of yours, you had a third corner. Yeah, it would be a fourth actually, right? It would be kind of a of a of a, a square rather. Yeah, but you know, relevance can be a, can be achieved with any of the three points that mm -hmm. exist there. Relevance is a different story. The, the argument about rigor and relevance is precisely what I was saying that you can have an, a, 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 a paper that is very well applied in terms of methodology, like this one about the algorithms, right? But the relevance is absolutely inexistent. I mean, who is going to, what, how, how is this going to make any difference, right? If I have eight seconds less to choose what professors I assign to what classes, I mean, <laughs> that's an extreme example of irrelevant. If you could, if you could run the, that algorithm for a whole week, it would still not bother you, right? Because you would leave it in a in an old PC <laughs> doing it. Really, do I do I gain a lot as a school because I earn I say eight seconds to schedule all my classes? I mean, it's ridiculous. And yet, that paper wanted to go into a journal. I mean, that means people absolutely don't care about relevance, and they do care more about rigor. That's when we start that that particular. Uh, uh, Controversy. Right. Well, Javier is asking there. What is the? Wh why is it so important to define uh, uh, the research uh, question or the? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that's what is going to guide the whole project. That's what is going to give it relevance, and it's going to is that that question also is going to tell you what methodology is best to use. Okay. Uh, so basically, I mean, without the research question, if you do a bad research question, you are going to have you're going to be doing a project. A very cumbersome, tardy, tiring, exhausting project to answer the wrong question. Research is everything about questions, and being able is there, is there, is everything about responding to questions. And being able to ask the right question is one of the main challenges. Of course, it is is absolutely the first and most important thing in the project. Guillermo, in that paper that you reviewed, where the guys were reducing were, uh, uh, reducing the time they needed to, let's say, to to, to define the yeah uh, yeah have to assign uh, professors to a particular do you think that that, that was the problem there uh, was uh, with respect to the research question that they they were involved with or well no you know the research question probably I mean they said that there was a there was a, an issue, and it might be the case for many universities, right, of uh, the, the difficulty and the time that it took to assign professors to particular uh, classes based on the history of what professors used to teach and so on. So they sold it kind of well at that moment. Mm -hmm. When, when they, you come in and say, okay, we have an algorithm that is proven to be very useful because it saves you eight seconds, like, what? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like... Uh, the, uh, the, uh, for starters, I was not very convinced with the question, okay? Mm -hmm. But, okay, let's see what you have to say. But when you tell me, okay, I did a, a, a heuristic algorithm that is better than yours, or a, or a, 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 a true, uh, I don't know if it was an artificial, uh, a natural network or something like that, uh, eight seconds, I mean, it's absurd. Mm -hmm. And then they come in and they conclude that it's so good that they have done a breakthrough in the research because they saved eight seconds. I mean, that's absurd. That's ridiculous. Yeah, w w one interesting thing is that probably those guys didn't go through this process of having their beautiful baby, let's say, as, as we, we talked at the beginning, shown to someone else, maybe even to someone, to, to a colleague in the department uh, or to to other to other colleagues. Uh, 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 we don't know if, the, if, if, if it was a professor or a student. You know, Alexander, I think that the sadder thing is that I do believe they did because he was an advisor who submitted that paper and the advisor is a very well-known person in that field. Mm -hmm. So how do you submit that? Didn't you read it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not going to say more because I don't want to ill talk about people, but, but it's amazing that an advisor that actually seen that thinks that he can get away with submitting that. Oh, you, you mean the, the advisor? Or so, so it was probably a thesis or, or, or a dissertation? It was and a thesis yeah. or something. And, and the advisor is the, actually the person who submitted it to the journal. Uh -huh. I like I can't believe you're doing this so, mm -hmm. because this is a very well known person, okay, from a different field, mm -hmm. but it's very very well known. So the, like maybe maybe the thing is uh, if that uh, if they probably had already done that uh, the work with the algorithm. 
to solve some other problem and then they thought well this journal here is interested in this kind of thing I don't know and let's see if this uh, uh, is catchy if they if they like it but of course again when uh, uh, it, it, it just has to go to the, the, the filters of one or two more people that could say, well, this doesn't seem right. I think, I think it was probably, the, this case is, is, is obvious to most of us, right? That uh, uh, it is a problem and maybe even, uh, uh, you know, designating professors to teach different classes is something that probably takes, uh, uh, sometimes if it's, it's an, a, a manual process, it takes a whole month of a, a, a person, so it's it's a very expensive time being consumed doing a very, uh, something that could be automated. But then the automation of that uh, leads to to a situation where if you, if you, if you have to keep your, uh, a computer running for a whole week to get to that solution, again, it's, it's cheap, cheap computer labor. Uh, it doesn't matter if it takes a week or it takes one day uh, or, or, or 20 seconds, right? So this, this is probably what, what Guilherme is considering ridiculous here. It doesn't matter. Of course, it's more convenient to have just a, a, a couple of hours of the computer running to, to get to that than having two weeks. But still, uh, it depends on uh, on how much that, the solution will cost. And, and even if it yeah. was an improvement of two weeks, yeah. he would say, okay, is this really that yeah. important? Yeah. Is this going to change the life of anybody? Exactly, yeah. Uh, or how difficult it is to implement this algorithm because they did for a particular mm -hmm. school, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't know. Any tips to choose a good research question? How can we evaluate if our research question will be received by well by the viewers? Okay, one of the uh, the uh, the main advice tips that I can give here is put your research question to the test with your peers and your professors. Uh, yes, any tips is ask yourself: Is this question being answered? Okay. Second, is this question different to uh, in, different enough to other questions of similar papers that have been written. Is this question bridging a gap? And uh, also, always think in a question that an answer of yes and no is never as rich as an answer of how. So, uh, with your question addresses the explanation of how something works, is going to be more relevant than simply if something happens or not, mm -hmm. uh, for most cases, okay? So, so yeah, try to explain more with your question, and, and then it will be a lot more relevant. But, but put it to the test. Show it to everybody else and say, would you be thrilled by the answer to this question? And see, yeah. see how they work. Yeah, you don't have to think of the reviewers as being any special people with a special kinds of uh, power to, to, to think that uh, a problem is a good problem or not. I mean, if you already think that it's a good problem, uh, and if you've already put it to the test, as Guillermo said, with some of your peers, with, with some of your colleagues, well, not your grandmother, or maybe even with your, your grandmother. Your, your gr grandmother may, may give uh, some very important... How, how could we say practical reasons for you to, 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 to consider that important or not? But basically what you do is you have your research uh, question and you have to, uh, uh, in, in, in preparing the readers uh, for your paper, you have in, in, in the introduction of your paper, you will probably show that that research question is an important question. You have to convince your readers, right? I'll be prepared. Be, keep in mind that uh, uh, reviewers are not from outer space. So they are persons just like you and me, mm -hmm. and you will find some good and some bad. Mm -hmm. Okay? So even if your research question is good, it might be not well received by a reviewer. That's okay. You need to, you just need to put up with it. Mm -hmm. Another uh, con uh, comment here, the term relevance has relationship with innovation. Created new issue in the field too. Interesting for research. Uh, yeah, it does. Uh, but I think the innovation uh, more than being a part of relevance is, is a part of providing new perspectives for answering to the question. But the question has to be relevant by itself, regardless of the method that you use. Uh, so yeah, the method can be innovative. The question itself, I'm not sure if it's innovative. I mean, it, it just has to be something that has not yet been responded to. And that is something that might make a difference in someone's life, being that someone a company, it means that someone a, uh, a, a public policy maker or uh, uh, 
a school, whatever, right? Well, but to some extent, that is the definition of uh, something being innovative, uh, being something that solves a problem that uh, hasn't been solved yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Guillermo, uh, uh, I was thinking, well, you mentioned the, the productivity paradox at the beginning of uh, your talk uh, today uh, as being yeah, something Dave that we, yeah, we had to deal with. And, and then, of course, we had this guy who was not uh, an academic, uh, a researcher in information systems, but who, if he were, he would be very, um, let's, uh, he, he would have enjoyed the fact that his uh, paper has been cited so much, uh, Nicholas Carr, a journalist who wrote, IT doesn't matter. So one thing that we, we and notice what he was doing was, uh, if, even at the title of his paper and, and the way he wrote the paper, and uh, it's a paper that everyone should read. It's catchy, have it. it's something that is like, it's like seeing the- We have uh, to have it catchy, exactly. Right? We have it's, to- It's like, like seeing the tabloids, it's like uh, something that is, oh, what a scandal. What we we have, we have to do that, right? If, if, we, if we can provide our readers with uh, not only a title, but with a research uh, uh, a problem, that they think, well, I want to know how this guy solves this. Uh, people will read it, and and and, and of course, that, then you have to deliver afterwards, right? First, you have to have a, an interesting research question. Yeah, I'm talking talking about being creative. Use a title that is catchy, yeah. right? That in a sense, in essence, it will reflect what you want to talk about, mm -hmm. but it's not the typical of the effect of IT in productivity. That's mm -hmm. boring, but IT doesn't work. That's catchy mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. Right? And again, so, 20, so. 20 years later, we still use that kind of uh, uh, paper to discuss, uh, uh, you know, the use of technology by organizations. Well, if, if this guy was so popular with it, uh, was he wrong? And, and we noticed that he was not wrong. He had a catchy title and, and he, 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 he discussed the, like, the, he created a research problem, let's say, that he could solve without, at the end, seeming stupid. Right? Uh, we still say, well, what, what he did back then was finding out that uh, IT could be used as, as infrastructure or it could be used for, for providing a, a, comp a, a competitive edge. And then we noticed, well, so he was not going against uh, IT. So maybe nowadays one of you could think of, uh, let's say, one of these, these uh, theories of ID or ideas that is, I mean, everyone takes for granted. And you find a way of showing that, well, I, it either shouldn't be taken for granted or maybe we should change directions. For example, I, I will give you a hint, something that, uh, 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 well, again, uh, Guillermo mentioned TAM, technology acceptin, uh, acceptance, uh, the technology acceptance model. It was written at a time that technology needed to be accepted because it was pushed uh, into uh, or pu pushed against people. Right, so we had to talk about acceptance. Do we still have to talk about acceptance these days, or should we start talking about maybe appropriation or the way that people choose the, the technology? That so maybe we could be a little like Nicholas Carr and write a paper like "Tam isn't right" or "Tam doesn't matter." You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I have been—I am one of the big supporters that appropriation is a much better term now than acceptance. Mm -hmm. Yet, you will see that people tend to cite popular research works because they think the reviewers are going to like them most. Mm -hmm. So it's going to say, if, if I'm writing a paper on anything, I will use STEM. Mm -hmm. And careful, if I do write a paper about a TAM extension or a TAM validation or a TAM, it will get rejected very likely because mm -hmm. everything has been written about TAM. Mm -hmm. Yet, if I'm going to write a paper about uh, pushing technology into the organization, I might want to cite TAM because everybody's expecting for me to cite TAM. And if I don't, they say, what's wrong with this guy? He's not citing TAM, right? <laughs> Unless my paper says, yeah, I'm not going to write about TAM anymore. And then we'll see, right? All right, uh, Guillermo, many, many researchers in, in Latin America, uh, we or, or, or many people that do research, students or professors sometimes education is a part-time job, right? They, they do that and at the same time they are practitioners, okay? Maybe that's the case of many of, uh, uh, of the people that are in this call now. They, they are doing their research, but at the same time, you know, they have to do something else. And that's a great possibility for people to, get, to, to engage in action research. Because action I mean, research think, means... Th th think about it. It's like, a, what questions do you pose yourself every day at work? Mm -hmm. How can we do this process better? 
how can we, uh, because you're always, we're always complaining at work, right? Mm -hmm. How come we're still doing this this way, right? And besides, so, you're there and you have to do something to change, right? Action research means that so, you exactly. you have to act, right? Sid? Now, if you become the agent of change, then that's a great opportunity for doing some action research project. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Because you have the ability to do the changes in your organization as long as you do, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if yeah. you don't, well, try to sell it to your boss, but it's not going to be that yeah. easy. So I, I, I think that we should be advocates for action research in, in this part of the world because here people really, they, they are there, they are expected to act in the sense that they are they're expect, expected to change reality. And if they do that using a scientific method of following up what they're doing and, and the effects that they're, the change that they are, they are imposing to reality is being measured somehow, that would, would, would be of interest. And this is something that is difficult to, to do many times, for example, in the United States, because their professors, well, Guilherme is like that right now, I am like that here in Brazil, we become uh, too theoretical because we, are not, we don't have our, our hands dirty of uh, grease, uh, in, in the sense that we are not there in, in, the, in the practical world uh, in which relevant objectives show up every day, right? So... Uh, no, absolutely. You have a, a golden opportunity if you are in a position in your organization that you can actually engage in building a project that is going to solve a problem. Uh, there you have it. I mean, and you're going to be able to do action research right away or design science. Design science also, yeah. And th that will attract a lot of people. Yeah, I, I don't know if, uh, 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 maybe you could, uh, uh, I, I don't know if we have anyone here who's a specialist among uh, the professor who's a specialist in design science research. Uh, I myself have uh, that uh, as a possibility for mainly for my students in the applied computing uh, program. Uh, I, I teach in, in applied computing and I, I teach in business. In business in general, design science uh, research is not the big thing. Uh, maybe action research would be more like that because they, they, they can solve a problem by simply, you know, changing things in the organization. But for, for those that are in a, in a computing uh, school uh, and have, uh, have to, and, and sometimes you, you part of uh, your development as a student or even a researcher is to build artifacts. Building artifacts is not going to be seen as anyone else except for the engineers as an end in itself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you will have to check how that artifact changes the world around it. And that is also a, a, a very interesting possibility uh, of doing research for those that are in the field. You build the artifact, but at the same time, you Absolutely. do it. Absolutely. If, if you are in the field and you are an IS guy in your organization, you build artifacts every day. Mm -hmm. Okay? Your projects are building artifacts yeah. that, are, that actually are meant to solve a problem in the organization. So there's your opportunity. All you have to do is you build your research around it. Yeah. and do it in a cyclical way and follow the tools and that, that will be probably a very good also uh, pointer to 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 help you do a better job at building the artifact for your organization as well not only for research mm -hmm. people you're too shy today uh, i know that we have a lot of people that just uh, came in and that are, are trying to figure out what they're doing here uh well, but who are these crazy guys talking about anything yeah you know, a lot of the conversation that I'm having here with Guilherme is, is at least expecting that you write something in the chat that we can turn into a, 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 a question and, <laughs> uh, and, and, and use his time uh, the best we can uh, uh, around here. But we definitely, this, this is something else that I, I took no, a note here, a note here. We definitely will look for someone who's a specialist in action research because that's a I'll good possibility. There. Pardon? Um. No, Hefner is as for research, uh, uh, design science, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh, you meant in action research? Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it could be yeah, Ned Koch, or yeah. although he's he hasn't been doing that lately, but we we will think of someone to bring uh, and talk about action uh, research. Michael. Ah. Uh, yeah, we we'll, we'll, we'll think about what that. What is the name of the What is the name of the comical actor? Michael. Comical actor. <laughs> yeah, the, the one that did the, the mini me and stuff like that. Do you remember that? Uh, no. Oh, Jesus. Uh, don't worry. Myers. 
Myers. Michael oh, Myers. Ma Michael, Ma Michael Myers. Michael Myers from New Zealand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's an expert in action. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe if we can get uh, uh, Michael Myers to 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 come and 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 talk with us, and maybe Havner. Well, that would be great. But this is something that we'll try. Otherwise, even if we don't have such big names, uh, 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 well, well the, the the big names in, in our field to come and talk to us, we will at least find someone, uh, a researcher that, he, that has some experience with that here in Latin America uh, and, and to, to come in and, and talk to us. Yeah, Aurora, go on. Aurora. I, 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 I appreciate so much, Guillermo, your, your talk. I think it was so interesting. I, I just um, connected a little late, but I was most of the time. I, I, I have a question re regarding the, the, the sources. You know, most of the time when we look for, for sources, some researchers said, no, your sources are too old, you know? So right. w w how do you distinguish a source that you could take to your, 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 your research as, a, as, a, as, a, as an obligated uh, source and, and others that you could, you know, uh, just uh, need to include as a new source? You know, that's a, that's yeah, a question. No, absolutely. That's your question is very, very legit legitimate. Uh, First, we have to recognize that there are some sources that are very old, but they're also classic, and they need to be cited, right? If they are very classic and they are, and, and you're still building on on those seminal studies, you have to cite them, even if they are from 1930 or 1950 or 1970, Ginsburg, for instance, right, or things like that. But uh, also, uh, you will it will be okay for you to cite sources that are old as long as you cite something that is new and from very, from a very uh, very uh, uh, well known source like everybody has to cite some MISQ ISR or whatever that are from actually from 2018 on right uh, so that you they know that your work was not done six years ago and has not been changed and they will know that you actually research the latest in that particular uh, topic, and therefore you have a more uh, common overview of it. Even if the source is marginally useful, it's good to show the editors that you did your research. Mm -hmm. So I would say at least, yeah, you have to include some of those. Now, if you don't find anything on that particular topic in the, pa in the, new, in the, in the past five years, then you have to say so. But it's a very risky, uh, statement because if there is and you did not find it, they will probably cook you alive. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's probably what I would say. I also have, you know, I have an impression, you know, having been working with reviewers for so long that sometimes, well, reviewers are humans like we are. Reviewers have a lot of other tasks to do. Reviewers are not paid uh, to review uh, other people's papers. So many times they, 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 they want to commit to, let's say, to, to our community and, and they will not refuse uh, reviewing a paper. But if they find a little flaw, they already say, well, I have, uh, you know, reasons enough to say that this paper has to be rejected the way it is right now. So hopefully it will come uh, in a better shape in the future. And then they, they just have a look at the, the references and see that the, the, the references are old, let's say they do not refer to any paper that was written in the last two years, they either assume that it's a paper that is that has already been rejected somewhere else and that you're trying, they're still pushing the same paper, or they they find a, a, an easy and fast excuse to say, well, the, 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 the authors didn't go through the trouble of, or well, to, to, uh, of, of you know, the, the, update, the, uh, yeah, the, making yeah. sure that uh, their 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 research is uh, still relevant, that someone else has not done the same over the last two or three years. So we have to think about the reviewers as gatekeepers, and we also have to be a little smart and say if they are going to have a an easy way of rejecting our paper, let's not give them that chance, right? So one reason uh, uh, to to make sure that your references are up to date, of course, the, the the, the noble reason is that you don't want to be researching something that other people have already done. So it, it is your duty to make sure that you review the, the literature, to make sure that your problem continues to be a relevant problem to all of us. But in addition to that, a more practical reason or... And, and even, even more so, you know, Alexander, you can say, oh, and I found these two or three papers, but actually they only speak about this, Yeah. right? 
making it evident that there's still a lack uh, of okay. this research in the field and therefore it's relevant. That, that will uh, also help you support the relevance of your paper, right? Even if you don't find it exactly on what it is, you found in what it's not. Mm -hmm. And then you say, and I could not find anything on this, so this is why it's relevant. Mm -hmm. But you are citing la the latest uh, references as well. Mm -hmm. But the old ones are okay as long as they're classic. Mm -hmm. Or if you're rebuilding on those, right? Like saying, okay, I'm taking this model from this, which was done in 89. Why this one in 89? I have to justify it. Yeah. Because from 89 to here, all these others do not accomplish the same. Okay, that's why. Yeah, over, so over. You have to justify why you took certain model from a certain other, uh, regardless of the date. Over, over the semester, you will hear, at least me, but po po probably also uh, many of our, other, our, of our other speakers, say that we have to be smart in writing our papers. We have to convince our readers that we have, we, we're presenting them uh, with a good paper, but the good paper has to be a good paper and seem to be a good paper. Both things are necessary. Uh, of course, if it is a good paper, it should seem a good paper, but sometimes it's, it's a very good paper uh, and it lacks, let's say, a reference from the last two years, simply because you, you, I mean, you did all the work that you, you, you needed and you simply didn't find anything that was, you thought, justifiable and then you left it uh, without a mention. You should state that and say, look, I have, you know, done my job here as uh, a, a, an uh, author and I have, I have done all, all the literature review that I should have done and everything. And in fact, this paper is being written because the problem is still there and it hasn't been addressed uh, appropriately. Uh, it's always a, a matter of being and seeming to be, because if we don't seem to be, uh, maybe we're, we're disregarded even when we are. Uh, I, I hope not to be too philosophical here, but uh, it's the same as being honest. You have to be honest and you have to seem to be honest as well. Uh, otherwise, people will not take you as, as being an honest person. So you have to do uh, all, all the effort, to put all the effort in writing to have the the best uh, possible writer, uh, uh, best uh, possible paper, and at the same time, you have to make the effort to make the others see that as a, a, an important and relevant uh, paper. Right? I hope I didn't conf confuse things up. <laughs> you probably did, yeah. Donna, hola. Uh, hi, I thank you for your your speech. It was very explosive. <laughs> You know, it went like from a smaller to, to, to elementary to more complicated. Um, I was going to say something about what you you commented on uh, finding the classic. Uh, I, I usually find the classic when I, I survey, uh, I review a lot of papers and I see the same, same paper reference. And then you say, ah, uh, this has to be the cue. And um, that's way, the way I can say, well, this is the man that is behind all this stuff. And well, it was the, the year also. No? That helps a lot. Oh, yes. It's like it's like uh, talking about national culture and not citing Hofstede. Even if, even if Hofstede is from 1981, it's the classic, it's the work, it's the seminal work on it. So you have to cite it, right? But that, that is a very clear justification, and nobody is going to say anything about it. But if you but cite something that nobody knows and it's from 1954, maybe you will raise a few eyebrows, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, people get it by, um, uh, go to the extreme and say, you only have to cite five years before. You cannot cite more. I said, but yeah, that, that means the, it's not very good. Yeah. As we said, they're human. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're right. That's You're right. absolutely right, yeah. You know, in that case, I believe that whoever is giving that kind of advice is only considering that you should appear to be uh, writing the good, the, 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 the good stuff, not necessarily concerned with writing the right thing. So you have to know why your, your references are there. Uh, and even if you think that maybe a poor reviewer will look at your paper and say, gee, she's citing here uh, an old reference. Uh, if it's there and you know why it's there, keep it there. You're the author. Right, you you remember the author is a little, uh, little dictator in the sense that 
he or she wants to 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 convince others of uh, his or her I mean, ideas. In your, in your response to the reviewer, yeah. yeah, I mean that is one of the examples that you have to say. I am citing this because it's a yeah. seminal work. It's a classical that that needs to be cited because I'm using it this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, regardless of the fact that I do have very more updated references as well, mm -hmm. uh, and don't worry about it because the editor should catch that. I mean, on top of the reviewers, there's the editor. And the editor should be able to see a comment by a reviewer that is a little out of line, and they will not pay much attention to that. Okay, please excuse me because I have some issue with my video. First, I had with the with the um with the um the mic, but now I have with the video. <laughs> well, I want to comment on something you said earlier. You were talking about variables, and then you talk about constructs. I've yeah. seen two way of mention. They, they are referring to the same. I think the same aspect, but um, when you it's, talk it's about not the same, but we use them interchangeably. I understand yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um. Then uh, what happened? I was writing, and I, I said, but "What do I do? I do constructs or I do variables?" Then I was reading in other papers, and I found out that. When they talk of, of theology, they call it construct. And uh, I'm not sure, but uh, that's what I more or less um, gather up. Yeah, the construct is a concept. Mm -hmm. So if I'm talking about user satisfaction, user satisfaction is a construct. And I define the construct as the level to which a particular user is happy with the results that is attaining, blah, blah, blah. The variable is the way to operationalize the construct. So when you put it in a statistical model, the construct becomes a variable. Uh, in the model itself, the construct is a construct. Mm -hmm. But normally we tend to use it interchangeably, right? And 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 uh, once you put it, for instance, your model says that uh, that uh, say uh, user satisfaction leads to uh, repurchase. Okay, those are the constructs in your model. And there's a causality when you put it in LM, in 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 a in a, in, in a structural equation modeling or you know regression, then one becomes x and the other one becomes y, and those are the variables. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the variable pretty much is the way to to operationalize a construct in a statistical model. So I should say, if I don't know if I'm saying something terrible, colleagues, you correct me. But in my in, we tend to use it interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Maybe the only the only thing that I could add there, Guilherme, is that we may have. Uh, in fact, when we turn into mathematics, it's going to and and mainly after it's it's been through. Uh, well, we don't want to get into very detailed uh, uh, modeling here, uh, but let's say if we if we if we do some um, factor analysis, for example, we will have one uh, one major variable that will be the construct. But in general, I could say that. Uh, you, you could possibly have several variables that you're collecting uh, information about and those variables together explain a, uh, or, or represent a construct. So uh, it could be that you have sure. several variables. It could be that you have more variables for one concept. Yeah, That's several right. variables to one concept. Uh, but but afterwards, when you, when you turn those, all those variables into one factor, for example, it becomes that factor becomes one variable. One so, variable, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, like as Alex was saying, in component in factor analysis, you obtain the components. But when you interpret the component, and yeah. you say, okay, based on the questions that are grouping together, this should be cues of satisfaction. Then you have a construct mm -hmm. and one variable that is going to be the the, 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 the sum of all the others. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, I don't know if you have any other questions to, today. You're quieter than usual. Uh, we didn't want to give that impression to Guillermo that we, that, uh, that it was, yeah, uh, uh, it, it was his fault, but it was his fault. <laughs> he, he gave us such good explanations that we, we, we had, uh, we didn't have that many questions at our end. No, now you understand it's a lot of information to digest, yeah. especially yeah. for the untrained eye. So yeah, I mean, I assume that you're going to be having this video available so they can go. The, vi the video yeah. it will and be available. There and is, There is my email. Feel free to shoot me an email if you have any more questions. I'll be happy to confuse you further. Yeah, the, the, the video will definitely be available on, on our Lakai's tube and accessible through Moodle as well. Your slides as well, if you send me the... I noticed that you've made little I changes uh, to, to the set of slides that I had already seen before. 
please send them and I will also make them available to everyone. Well, in our... I translated them for starters, yeah. <laughs> oh, I saw it in Spanish, right? I never see the language that we are using, you know. The original word is Spanish, yeah. Yeah, Guillermo and I, sometimes we talk to each other in Portuguese, sometimes we talk uh, to each other in English. I never I never pay attention to the language, whatever happens. Identifies yeah. <laughs> and, and he even <laughs> speaks Portuguese, yeah, he even speaks Portuguese. Well, uh, all right, uh, let me just give you a hint of what we're doing uh, next week. Uh, if I find here just a second, uh, next week we will have uh, a few very, uh, well, let's say, uh, so, so we we're talking about people that we want to invite here, uh, may, maybe uh, Michael Myers and Hevner, but next week we'll, we'll already have people that are we consider as, as big as those. We'll have uh, Professor Eleanor uh, Loyacono, Professor George Maracas, and Professor Fred Niederman. Uh, they are three very active uh, researchers in our uh, information systems uh, area. And uh, we, th we thought of having a panel among them, uh, and well, coordinated by, 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 by one of us here, uh, in which we, we will put them to discuss the ideas that, let's say, uh, that made information systems as a field be what it is today, but at the same time to think of ideas of what information systems will be or could be in the future, because those could all represent some good research questions, some good objectives for, for our research. So today we talked a bit about the methods or the, hows, uh, the, the how to, to reach our objectives. Next week we go back to our objectives uh, in this uh, panel. Uh, involving these three in important researchers in, in our field. So uh, don't miss if you think that uh, there, there, there are other people that could be interested in, in, in being part of this. Again, I think uh, I, I, still, I noticed that we still had a, a, some people that, uh, that filled in the form for today. I, I will try to have all those people that have filled the form included in the, in the course in the sense that by the end of the semester you can get uh, a certificate uh, for, for, for this. Uh, people that start joining from now on, it will be impossible because at some stage, my dean will, 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 keep, will ask me, doesn't people stop coming to this uh, class? Uh, do you have different people every week? And I say, well, we want to, to have as many people as, uh, as we can because we want to have as many papers next year on AMSIS as we can. So we will be welcoming people if they, they want to come only for our last session in December. We'll be happy to have them here, but of course, I will not be able to uh, uh, provide them with uh, with this uh, certificate from the from from the university here if they arrive late. So today is going to be the last day that we can. Whoever is in my in, in that form, the Google in that Google form today, will be considered part officially part of the group. But welcome anyone who wants anyone else who wants to to, to come uh, whenever they want. They are all uh, all welcome. You just have to share. The, the link, but please share this link with uh, Koshu, Koshu, uh, uh, Koshus. Don't share it in 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 let's say in in Facebook uh, because we don't want uh, anyone to come and zoom bomb us. Uh, I'm a little scared about this because I in, in, I had two situations in the pa in, in the past during the pandemic where we get people we got people that were not interested in what we were doing here. They were only interested in messing up with what we were doing. So, but share with. With your colleagues, share with uh, with uh, people that you believe that could benefit from this. All right. So if no no more I questions. I already in your email. Or something. I Pardon? already sent them to you. Pardon? I I already sent the slides to you. Oh okay. So so uh, uh, today uh, you will have the slides and the video at some 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 time already in in our uh, in our Moodle. Okay. So see you guys next week uh, for this important uh, meeting with. Uh, Loyacano, Maracas, and uh, Niederman. See you.